What a pleasure it is, what an honor it is to be up here to preach, to be a part of this summer series. Uh, I'm so thankful, especially with the wealth of talent that Mount Vernon has to be included in this. Um, so I'm very thankful. I love every one of y'all. I, I, I miss y'all whenever I'm not here. And apparently y'all miss me because you've said so. So I do appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, my topic this evening is why do we stay silent when the Bible is silent? You know, it's one of those ones where I really just want to say because God says so and drop the mic and fade away and sing for the rest of the 45 minutes. <laughs> But that would not be beneficial to any of us because it's not, we need to know why God says so. What, what, what this has to do with is scriptural authority. So many people in the world today do not hold the word of God up where it belongs. They look at this as a book written by men. And if it was a book meant, written by men, then what is it? it doesn't matter what it says. We can add to it and take away from it all we want. But we know that this wasn't a book written by men. Why? Because it testifies that of itself. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 affirms this. And this is what we base all of our foundation on. If you don't believe that this was breathed from God through the Holy Spirit and penned by men, then what are we doing here? Then we're just following after other men, which... Men don't have the power to save. Scripture, God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, those have the power to save. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That a man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. This was breathed by God and penned by men. That is the foundation of our belief. That is, if we don't believe that, then why would we believe anything in it? We have to believe that this was a work of God. Why does it matter? Well, this is how God has chosen to speak to us. He doesn't come down. Now, it'd be great if God would just be like, and we have all everything we need. But it doesn't work that way. He, because then we'd just be a bunch of robots. Because you know why? God wants everyone to be saved. Then he would do that to every single person. And we'd all be robots. And everybody, that, that, that verse that says, narrow is the gate. No, it'd say, wide is the gate and everybody's coming. Because God just smacked the knowledge into every single person. And everybody's coming. Because if you knew, if you knew what God knows... You wouldn't, you wouldn't choose to go to hell. You wouldn't choose to, to take his word and blasphemy all about it. You wouldn't choose to make noise when God has been silent. No one would. God doesn't operate that way. We have the choice. God, we know. God chooses those who choose him. We know this. And he's operating through the Holy Spirit, through His Word, to give us that choice. Words are important. It's how God has chosen to save us, through our words and actions. And I look at silence, well, that's an action. When we speak, it's an action. When we're silent, it's an action. It, people don't realize when the Bible is silent, that means that's it, either an action one way or the other. I look at it like this. People say, well, what do you mean when the Bible's silent? Well, I look at it like this. Let me give it a demonstration because I had to think of a demonstration because I'm pretty simple. Y'all know I'm a simple man, and, and I have to break things down into something I can understand. God walks into a restaurant, right? He sits down. He looks at the menu. He orders a chicken fried steak and a glass of water. He expects the waiter to bring a chicken fried steak and a glass of water. Well, the chicken fried steak and the glass of water come out, and the waitress, or the waiter, wait, the wait staff, I'm not saying one way or the other, the wait staff comes out, hands him a Dr. Pepper, and he says, I didn't order this Dr. Pepper. And the wait staff says, Well, you know what? I thought that would go really good with that chicken fried steak you did order. So I'm going to give you that Dr. Pepper. I don't want a Dr. Pepper. I don't care what you want. I'm giving you this Dr. Pepper because I think it goes good with your chicken fried steak. 
God says, I don't want the Dr. Pepper. It offends me that you think you know what I want when I haven't asked for it. I have asked for a chicken fried steak and a water. And now you're thinking you know better than me by bringing me the Dr. Pepper and making me take it. I don't want it. It offends me. Get it off my table. It's on the table. You do with what you want. We're not, I'm not taking it away. I'm giving you that Dr. Pepper if you want it or not. That's what we do when we add to the Word of God. When we add something to the Word of God, we're forcing upon God something He's never asked for. He didn't want the Dr. Pepper. He's not going to accept the Dr. Pepper. And he sure isn't going to drink that Dr. Pepper. Why in the world would we force something upon God that He's never wanted? He's never asked for. We're saying we know better what He wants better than He does. How do we know what God wants? He's given it to us. Word for word, line by line. He's given us exactly what He wants. The Bible gives us all things pertaining to worship, life and godliness, in spirit and in truth. How do I know this? John 4, 23 through 24. But the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Well, then we ask, what is the truth? That's easy too. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is the truth. This is the truth. This is everything he's given us to be pleasing to him. The Dr. Pepper isn't in here, but the chicken fried steak and water is. Leave the Dr. Pepper out. So when we're silent, we're saying, okay, we respect what you've asked for, and we're not going to ask, give anything that you haven't asked for. So, this goes back to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, when we give something to God that He hasn't asked for, we're adding to the Word of God when we should have been silent on the issue. Should have been silent. God didn't ask for it, we shouldn't give it. We need to stay silent on the issues. When God doesn't say, I want this, He is never going to leave us in the dark for worship. He never has. Since the dawn of time, He hasn't left man in, in, in the dark in what He wants from him. Nothing new right now. Nothing new today. When we say we want to give him something that he doesn't want, when we speak where he is silent, we're saying we know better than he does. I don't know about you. That is not what I want to have to answer for on my day of judgment. I've got a whole lot of other things I'm going to have to answer for. But speaking where he has been silent is not one of them. Church, we must be very careful on this. We must teach our neighbors. We must teach religious people in the religious world don't realize how dangerous this is to add in to the Word of God what He does not want. We see it all around us. We've even seen it. I'll give you an example. My mom, she's a dog sitter. She's dog sitting one of my sister's friends, and it's a different part of town, and she didn't even... She, she's away from her church, but she didn't want to miss church. You know, she didn't want to, she's away from her congregation. But she didn't realize when she went to the United Church of Christ that she wasn't walking into the Lord's church. And she walked in, and she was there about 20 minutes and walked out horrified. And was just called me up and couldn't believe it. Was just like, I can't believe, oh, well, it was, she was in panic because of the things that were going on in worship at that church. Or I should say that it's not a church. It's, I don't know what they were doing. She's had, had a whole, whole list of things she had written down. I was like, Mom, well, that's why you 
Look them up on the internet first before you go walking in the door. Now I talked to her today and she's found a, a fellowship of the Church of Christ near there that she's like, well, it's a little further away, but it's the church. And I was like, okay, mom, great. So it makes me happy that my mom knows the difference. Most people don't. Most people do not know the difference between the Lord's church and the world's church. We have to be careful. John says, do not be among the world. <laughs> the world doesn't realize it, that they're worshiping not in spirit and in truth, but what they're doing is blaspheming God. They do not have the favor of God. You know, God says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, John 14, 15. That is a measure of if we're silent when we're supposed to be silent, or if we speak when we're supposed to speak. If we truly love God, we will follow the Bible as the Bible proclaims. We don't need, God doesn't need extra, he doesn't need a Dr. Pepper and he doesn't need a side of fries. He wants what he wants, and he's given us exactly what he wants. I'm gonna go into some examples because uh, these are some Old Testament examples. But you know, we, it's easy to look in the world around us and see nowadays examples. But I want to go into some Old Testament examples of, of what happens when people aren't silent, when the Bible's silent. When people go against the Word of God, what God does. And it's, it's pretty rough. I mean, I don't want this to happen to me. It's always had stiff repercussions to adding to His Word. And when I say adding to His Word, we're adding to His Word when we take action that adds to the Word of God, that adds when we take actions that are not part of what He's commanded. So look at Cain. First example, it's not like this is anything new. This has been going on since the beginning of time. Cain, what did he exactly do that was wrong? We're not given, but I guarantee you he knew. I guarantee you God didn't leave him in the dark of what he wanted. But what did Cain do? He offered to him what he wanted to offer him fruit of the ground. You know, Genesis 4, 10 through 12, what was the repercussion of Cain not giving God what he wanted? Well, let's see. God says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, you shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a bag vagabond you shall be on the earth. He was in God's favor. He gave God what he didn't want. What did he do? He got mad about it. He got jealous about it. He took action. He spoke where God didn't speak and killed his own brother over it. Now... We know that that line has completely been wiped out. There is no more descendants of Cain. Another example, Nadab and Abihu. I mean, these are classic examples. I just love these examples because they really hit home. Nadab and Abihu, they added to the word of God when they should have been silent. God told them exactly what he wanted from them. They knew exactly what kind of fire to offer. It wasn't any mystery. It was right there in writing. Moses had given them the list of everything that they wanted. Leviticus 10, verses 1 and 2. Nadab and Abihu knew what they wanted, knew what God wanted. But what did they do? They gave, them, gave God what they wanted to give him. They just took it upon themselves to add to his word. What did they add? Well, let's read. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it put incense on it, here we go, and offered profane fire before the Lord. They added to the word of God. Do we know what the profane fire was? No. But we know it wasn't what God asked for. How many in the world are giving God something they didn't ask for? Something he didn't ask for, excuse me. You can walk into even buildings with the name Church of Christ on them and see blasphemous behavior, them offering God because it pleases the, the crowds, 
offering something God has never asked for. What happened to Nadab and Abihu because of this? Here we go. Put incense on and offer profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So what happened? So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them. And they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who came, come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. What did they offer? They offered something God didn't ask for. What happened? They were devoured. What did it cause others to do? Go back and look at the Word of God and say, Well, this is what God commanded us. We need to make sure that we are looking at the Word of God. We need to make sure that we know exactly what He's asked for and that we're giving Him exactly that. Nothing more, nothing less in our daily worship, in our congregational worship, in our prayers, in our thoughts. We need to make sure that we're aligned with the will of God. Another example, uh, Uzi, Uzziah. I always like this. I can't pronounce Hebrew words all that good. Uzziah. <clears throat> you know, Uzziah, what did he do? He added to the word of God. When he reached out and touched that ark, he added something. He was no longer silent where God had been silent. God had given them explicit instructions not to, not to carry that ark on an ox or cart, any of that. He had given specific instructions, actually built rings into the ark for the poles for the specific instruction of that that ark was to be carried at all times. That way it couldn't be dropped from an, ark, an ox. And that way it couldn't be touched by man. You know, 2 Samuel 6, 6 through 7 And when they came to Nachos, that's Nachins, Nachins, Nach, Nachos threshing floor, we'll go with that. Uzziah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the ox stumbled. And what happens? The, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzziah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there before the ark. Through his action, he added to the word of God. He was not silent. He should have, if they would have been in the Word of God and known, he would have not ever touched that ark. They would have never been on the ox. They'd have never been in that position to begin with. What did that action, what had happened? What well, caused David to go back and look at what the Word of God said before they moved that ark again? He was mad, but it, well, you know what it did? It caused him to go back and find out exactly what God had said. Find out exactly if God was silent somewhere or if he had spoken somewhere. And then they followed it. They followed it to a T after that. Sometimes God has to arouse his anger against us to make us realize and snap out of this what I want stuff. I'm, I feel for the religious world because it's all about them and it's not about God. We can see that in another example of, of Naaman. This is an example of, of it being about what he wants. It's not about what God said to do. It's about what I want to do. I don't want to go down to that dirty Jordan River. Man, I got some rivers over here that are just like the Frio River here in, in Central Texas. It's crystal clear and blue and nice. That Jordan, man, was, that's nasty. He didn't want to go over there. He didn't want to do what God told him to do. But without doing what God told him to do, he wasn't going to be healed. If we don't do what God tells us to do, we're not going to see salvation. It's simple as that. So many in the religious world claim to have salvation when they are nothing but furthest from it. They're being tricked by a trick of the devil. The devil has many ways, many tricks. And a lot of them are through the religious world. We may not want to look at it that way, but it is. The religious world is going to be half a surprise when the Lord comes back or when they meet their maker. I mean, 
Not everybody's going to find out. They're going to find out that, that what God said in his Bible was true. And he meant it word for word. He meant it when he said, Do not take away or add to my word. Look at Na Naaman. 2 Kings 5, 10 through 14. See what happens when Naaman decides that he's going to take it under his own control. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Well, that should have been enough. That should have been enough for him to go and do it. But did he? No. What happened? Keep reading. But Naaman became furious. Here, God's saying, here, I'll make you clean. No, I'm going to be mad at you because you're not doing it the way I want you to do it. Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over this place and heal the leprosy. Are not Abaha and uh, Pafar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? Here he is saying, I know what God said, but can't I do it this way? How many people do we know that are exactly like that? I know what the word says, but he knows what's in my heart. He knows what's going to make me happy. And really, that's all that's important is making me happy. I, I don't really care what the word of God says. I, I want to be happy, but I also want to be a Christian. He knows. He gets it right. Not according to the word of God. So he turned and went away in rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. He didn't want to do it. But when he did what the word said, when God said to do this through his prophet... He got what he wanted. When we do what the Word of God says, we will get what we want. Yeah. True happiness, peace with God, salvation, not having to spend eternity in hell. That's what we'll receive when we are obedient to His Word. When we are silent, when the Bible is silent. When we speak where it speaks. These are just a few of the examples of man adding to the Word of God and by implication not staying silent when the Bible was silent. Their actions spoke louder than words. Their actions, our actions, will speak louder than words. Our actions sometimes in our silence is loud, very loud. Speaking through actions when God has not spoken is nothing new. As we have seen, it goes all the way back to the beginning. It was a big problem in the first century, and it is a huge problem in the 21st century. That's what we're in, right? 21st? Yeah. Okay. 21st century. Huge problem in the 21st century. Nothing new. You know? And I'm, I don't know what this question was directly addressing because there was no verse next to it. It was just, so why are we silent when the Bible is silent? So I'm like... Well, let me think. So, what I've come up with is it probably has to do with musical instruments. This is one of the biggest questions. It's one of the biggest things. I mean, I could think of a lot of different ways where we're silent when we need to be silent, and the world is not. Musical instruments is one of the biggest ones that a lot of people just can't grasp. Oh, well, they had it in the Old Testament. Well, they also had killing animals and sprinkling the blood over the altar and showing up in Jerusalem four times a year and all this other stuff in a temple and all of this other stuff that we don't have today. So if you keep the old law, you have to keep all of the old law. You can't just keep, well, we like the instrument part of the old law. We're going to have flutes and horns and 
all this stuff. Well, really, we're just going to have a six-piece band, and it's going to be a rock show when you come to worship. So, but that doesn't work. That doesn't work for God. God is not about that. What has he asked for? What has the Bible said when it comes to musical instruments? Nothing. There is not one single mention of musical instruments in the New Testament. Well, it doesn't say not to use them. Well, it also doesn't say to smoke crack and, and all this other stuff. But we know better, right? We know not to do that. It doesn't say a lot of stuff. But we know through implication that that means we are not to do it. If it doesn't say specifically to do it, we don't do it. What does it say about musical instruments in the New Testament? Nothing. What are we to use? Our voice. The word is pasalo, and it means to pluck. And, and it's actually followed directly behind what you are to pluck. And it says, pluck the heartstrings. How do you pluck your heartstrings? You sing. There's no instruments in this. Let's look at what it does say about what we're to bring to the Lord in worship. Ephesians 5.19. I mean, it's one we should all know. It has to do with what we're to bring to the Lord, and it's our voice. That's all he wants. He doesn't want musical instruments. He doesn't want it to be about a show about how good the people are playing. He wants us all to sing together as one, as his people. Ephesians 5.19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Pretty simple. It doesn't say anything about musical instruments there, does it? I've looked all through the New Testament. I mean, and I say that. I've read it all in school a few times because I'm one of those people that have to read it like three or four times to understand it the first time. So I've read it a lot. Not enough. I need to read it more. But I know for sure there is never once, ever, once mentioned musical instruments in the New Testament. Ever once that they were bringing musical instruments to God in worship. Ever. If you can find it, let me know because you have a translation that I have not seen. Because none of the translations, even the ones that are over here in left field, say anything about musical instruments. Not a single one. What else does it say? Let's Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Turn there with me. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. And this, if there's musical instruments in this, then I'm missing something because here it's talking about the same thing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Here we go. And whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So just by logic, if we were up here playing musical instruments, how is that admonishing one another? It isn't. It's putting the direct action upon a few selected people and their skill and, and how they can play. But I've never heard a guitar admonish anyone except the person playing the guitar. If we're to do this together, then we must all, if, if we were to add musical instruments, we all got to play it. Because this says doing it together, so that means everybody's got to have a guitar. Every single one of us. And we all got to sound good, okay? Because otherwise we'd be here saying, Nobody wants that. That doesn't admonish anyone. It makes a bunch of noise. You know what it sounds like to God? When the, even when the best guitarist is up here playing to him in worship, you know what that sounds like to him? 
noise, a bunch of junk. I don't care how good they are. God didn't ask for it. He doesn't accept it. He doesn't want it. And actually, you are sinning by partaking in that. If it's not in spirit and in truth, you are in sin. If you're up here rocking out to the Lord, you're in sin. If you're not singing to each other spiritual songs and hymns to admonish one another, to teach each other, that's why we don't just have any old songs. The songs we sing are encouragement to each other. Or encouragement to each other and, and glorifying God. He, and thankfully, he didn't say you had to sound good. Y'all sound great. Y'all sound great. Sit behind Jesse Moser and, and you'll hear the angels singing. <laughs> but, you know, it didn't say we had to sound good, and that's a blessing. He just says, sing. Admonish one each, each other. Teach each other. Love each other. Love him. We can't do that if we're just doing whatever we want to do. It has nothing to do with what we want. Worship has nothing to do with what we want. If it did, there'd be an ice cream machine right down here over here, a coffee maker over there, and this would be a barbecue uh, every worship assembly if it was with what I wanted. But it's not about what I want. It's about what God wants from us. He has written this specifically with what He wants from us. He didn't say, do it as you feel. Oh, I know your heart. Do what you want and I'll accept it all. No. Far from that. Actually, turn with me to Revelation 22 and 18 through 19. And let's see what God says about just giving him in old, any old thing. Revelation 22, 18 through 19. And see what God says about adding to or taking away from his word and what the consequences are when we're not silent, when the Bible is silent. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of this, the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, oh man, here it comes, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Simple, clear. I, I don't know where... In the religious world, they miss this part because they like to talk about Revelation all the time and how, ah, oh, end times and all this and it's now. And they sure do study it, but they breeze right over this as they follow the doctrine of man, as they go to churches that have names of men on them, as they go and worship according to some guy in the Reformation movement where they were trying to reform the Catholic Church, which was an apostasy from the beginning. It was a blasphemous movement from the beginning. And so they tried to reform that. We get the Lutherans, the Baptists, we get all of these, the Methodists, we get all of these different churches. I, I hate to even call them churches because y'all know what church means, ecclesia, the called out. It's hard to say the called out of the Lutheran, the called out of the Methodist, the called out of the Baptist? What does that even mean? They obviously don't know what church means to even call their gatherings that. They must look over this because this looks pretty, this is dangerous. This is clear to me. I don't want to add to the word of God and receive the plagues that are written in this book. Did they read the plagues that were written in this book? Pretty rough. Or take away from it, and be taken my name out of the book of life? I mean, that's what we got to look forward to. So when we're baptized New Testament Christians, our name was added to that book of life. Why would you ever do something to get your name taken back out of that? Especially by 
heading to worship something that God never even wanted in the first place. I just don't understand. No, I want to be the call, part of the called out of Christ, the church of Christ. We are called out of the world to be Christians, to be his people, to be his body, to be part of his kingdom. We've been called out of the world. I don't know about y'all, that's something special to me. As a part of the world for so long, I was so happy to be called out of that. I was so happy to be added to the body of Christ by God himself through baptism. Why would you give that up? Just so you could please yourself? So you could add to his word? Make noise where there's no noise needed? I don't know about y'all, but I find the singing beautiful. I don't know how many of y'all were at the home when we had that fish fry. Woo! That singing was amazing. The singing here is amazing. I don't care if there's two people in the auditorium and they're singing together. That's amazing. They ain't even got to sound good. You know why? Because they're singing from their hearts to the Lord just as he has asked. That's amazing. That's wonderful. Don't ever give that up. Don't ever put that down and think that we need to make noise where God's not made noise. You know, this was a problem in the first century. How do we know? Because Peter says they're coming. Jude says they're here. First John says they're here. They've left, but they're coming back. We know they are here. Not in this building. They are here amongst the world that we're living in the Antichrist, the people who are not following after God but claiming his name. So many people claim to be Christians but will not follow his word, will not do it as he's asked. They are not silent where the Bible is silent. They make a lot of noise when there's no need. God hasn't asked a whole lot from us. He just asks us to change everything. That ain't too much, right? Because look at the blessings we get. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. What an amazing life. If you don't think so, come hang out at the home for a little bit and see these guys that used to be miserable laughing. I got to come in there and tell them, yo, cut all that laughing out. You're bothering me. Everybody's happy. You know why? Because they're not miserable anymore. God has never been burdensome. He just wants us to follow him. He wants us to follow him as he's asked. And not by our own way, but by his way. It's not that hard. We sing to the Lord. We pray. We observe the Lord's Supper. We give of our means. We hear a preaching and teaching. We love each other. We love him. We love the word. What's amazing is that he loves us enough to give us the word. Why would we ever not study it and keep silent where he has been silent or speak where he has spoken? You know, turn with me. We're going to go back to 2 Timothy. It's where we started. Turn with me to 2 Timothy, and we're going to read chapter 4. This is the charge that Paul has given Timothy, and it's the same charge that he's given us through implication. Now, this wasn't written to us, but by implication, it, it means the same to us as it did Timothy. It needs to. Because this is what we've been called out to do. We've been called out to share the gospel. If we're not doing that, we're missing our calling. We're missing what he's called us out to do. We're not doing, we're making noise in the wrong places. We're silent when we should be talking. Don't let this happen to you. I charge you therefore before God and Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. Here we go. This time is here. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth 
and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of evangelists. Fulfill your ministry. Pretty simple charge. I look at that as like, that's the charge. You know, they give charges to college graduates and, and all this, you know. I look at this as this is our charge. This is what we're called out to do. This is God's charge to us to make sure that we stay true to the doctrine, that we stay true to the words in this book. Because people like to, they like to make up stuff. They like, this, this, for a lot of people, this is too simple for them. They got to make it fancy. Well, we need a 15-piece band. Why? Well, I like how it sounds. We, we don't want to make the Lord's Supper too common. So we're going to only observe it every few months. I don't care what the Bible actually says about it. Well, I'm, I'm a woman and I want to preach. I don't care that the Bible says I'm not to preach to assembly of mixed men and women. I don't care. Uh, God knows my heart. He, he'll, he'll be okay with it, right? Because I'm super special. I'm going to call myself a pastor and I'm going to have a church. I don't care what God says. So many different ways they're burning down the word of God blaspheming what God has said they're speaking when God has been silent they're making a whole bunch of noise but they will pay but my charge to us this evening is that we have compassion on them they're in error that don't mean that God doesn't love them too and he needs us to teach them the truth. It's difficult sometimes. People don't want to hear the truth. But what are we to do? We're to teach them the truth. We're to have compassion on them and look at them as God looks at them, as a lost soul. As somebody who needs to be taught the right way. And once they've been taught the right way, they either accept it or they don't. Sometimes even Jesus says, dust the feet off and move on. If they're, they're not willing, their heart ain't right, and they're not willing to accept it, you can't do nothing about that. But my charge to all of us is that we do something about it, that we talk to them. We share with our religious believers, because I, I dare not call them Christians. Because if they were Christians, they'd be doing what God asked. But they're believers. But is that enough to get to heaven? Even the devil believes in God. And the demons believe and tremble. It's not enough to get to heaven just to believe. But to be obedient to his will. If they love me, they will do my commandments. We've got to love those lost souls enough that we try to teach them. That we try to reach out to them. Jerry asked me the other day, do we do door knocking? I said, no. But we might need to. We might need to set up something where we go out and we start knocking on doors again and inviting people to church and asking for a dinner, inviting them over for dinner, inviting them to share the gospel with them. Maybe, maybe we need to get back to that. Let's get, let's get back to being taking the simple gospel to the simple people. And we know that it's in its power to save, that when their heart is right, they'll accept it. If their heart isn't, they're not gonna. They're gonna go to that rock show where they're lost. But we gotta have love for the souls and bring them to this beautiful singing assembly. The people of God who meet at the Mount Vernon congregation here in Mount Vernon. I love every one of y'all. If there's anyone here tonight who has not been added to the body of Christ, who has not obeyed the gospel, we can help you with that. If there's anyone here tonight who just needs the prayer of the church, maybe you've been lost. Maybe you have some unanswered sin in your life. Maybe you just need prayers. We know how much prayers mean, especially a group this, this large. And I tell you what, the hugs you get after you come forward, nothing in this world compares to that. Getting almost 100 hugs from your fellow brethren, nothing like that. 
So don't be ashamed. If there's anything we can do for you, please come down now as we sing the invitation song.